the stage, co-founder and chairman Moderna, Nubar Afayan, and once again, our moderator, Linda Henry. What an inspiring conversation that was, and what a fantastic conversation we have now to look forward to with Nubar. It is wonderful to be with you again. Um, so Nubar is the ultimate solver. He has dedicated his career to improving the human condition by systematically creating science-based innovations that serve as the foundation for startup companies. So in the business world, we celebrate the serial entrepreneur who's done you know, one startup and then maybe they do a, another one and then the super prolific ones will have done three or four. Um, it, but during Nubar's career as an inventor, an entrepreneur and CEO, he has co-founded and helped build over 80 life science and technology startups and he is still going. Um, as with many brilliant world-changing scientists, he is of course a graduate of MIT. Um, so we just heard Yuval's closing that he's thinking about ethical innovation through three rules. Number one, that people's data shouldn't be used to manipulate them. Number two, data shouldn't be concentrated in one place. And three, whenever top-down surveillance increases, so too must bottom up. You describe your work at Flagship Pioneering as always starting with the question, what if? Moderna started with an idea, not a product, for example. What are your own rules that go along with that question? Well, thanks, Linda. Thanks for having me back. Uh, it's great to be back in person. I was there in the May 19, one last one of these, so it feels like just yesterday. <laughs> um, so indeed, we, we um, practice a particular kind of innovation where we start out imagining what could be and trying to see if we can attach that to value, uh, usually starting with neither science that is proven nor products that exist or even needs that can be demonstrated. So it's very much a future backwards way of looking at things. And even there, you have to keep in mind the degree to which what you're enabling will impact society, not just for the good, but also unintended consequences. So when we ask these what if questions, it gives us the ability to first take some time imagining what will happen if what you're tr imagining becomes reality. And long before you make it reality, you can prepare for it. You can prepare for it with, with communication, for example, so people understand what you're trying to enable. Uh, you can prepare for it by safeguards that you put in place and many other things. So I think that's an integral part of creating previously uh, unimagined platforms. And I think the experience with Moderna is, is a very important one because 12 years ago when we started asking what ifs, the questions for us were, what if a patient could make a drug, any drug, inside their body? And there was no way of doing that back 12 years ago. In fact, many people still don't believe you can do that because they're willing to concede we could do it with one vaccine but nothing else. But in fact, we think you can make just about any protein in the body and either activate the immune system or deactivate the immune system or fight different kinds of diseases and inflammation, et cetera. And when you're gonna do that, you can start thinking about, okay, what would safeguards be? You know, how much measurement capability you need to know where these molecules are going and what they're doing, on and on. We can talk more about it. So we have our own kind of thinking about the in incorporating, I'd say, almost futuristic uh, ethical considerations because in order to create some of these technologies, it's almost going to be too late once it's enabled, and you got to think about it in advance. And we spent quite a bit of time on that. Um, there are so many, so many um things on that last answer that I want to pull on. One is that you use that very scientific term, imagination. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk to about that role in your innovation process? Yeah, I can. You know, I came down to MIT in 1983, and like a lot of graduate students here, um, I had, you know, excelled in, 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 in university. I'd, I'd gone to uh, McGill University, mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I was lucky enough to get in here. And at the time, I thought of the biggest kind of... Uh, a uh, uh, sign of success, like, you know, if you're a basketball player, it's how many uh, baskets you make, how many points you score. In, in, in academic science or in, in research, it's, you know, kind of how right you are, how much knowledge you have, how reasonable, how good your reasoning skills are. 
And over time, 35 years later, what I learned is those things are kind of necessary but not sufficient for big innovations because it turns out that, in my view, the biggest faculty we're given innately as humans is our ability to imagine. Mm. And that in addition to knowledge helping us and our reasoning skills helping us prosecute the present, it also is a companion when you're imagining a future because your, the, your future imagination gets shaped by how well you understand the present. If you know laws of physics, if you understand biology as best you can, it governs how you're gonna imagine it. Now, you might be sitting in the crowd saying, well, geez, wouldn't it be great if you don't have any of that? Because then you can even imagine even big, bigger things. You can imagine the world without gravity. Or, but the reality is, or I can imagine myself being 10 pounds, but the reality is that, that it turns out to make practical things, you need to con constrain your imagination or at least accompany it. So anyway, why do I say that? I'm using the word imagination more times than I'm sure it's been used, at least in a scientific context, at Kresge for a long time in this hall. And yet, I believe the thing that I never learned was the degree to which imagination is something we have to invest in and allow for. Because imagination will allow you to say things that don't seem reasonable, seem completely unrealistic, unachievable, and you've got to be able to say that. Now you might say, why? And the reason is that most, I think, breakthrough innovations, this is a for fundamental belief I have and I have lots of data for it, most, al almost all, if not all, breakthrough innovations, in my view, are not made by humans. They emerge. And they emerge through a process that is best understood as Darwinian evolution, which is variation, selection, iteration, more variation, more selection. And at some point, those cycles gain some major advantage and they enable something that's really valuable. The people who happen to be there claim their stakes of that innovation and describe it as some unbelievable act of genius. But in my experience, a lot of this is purely emergent. That's why we, we call this emergent innovation. So you might say, what does that have to do with imagination? The thing that you need is to be able to imagine variations be able to subject them to selection pressure, not only about the current world, but in the future imaginary world, and then iterate, iterate, iterate. And so my belief is, and, and, and I, I hope you'll consider it, that fantastic breakthroughs are the descendants of really bad ideas. If you don't believe me, go online and look at the earliest form of the iPhone that Apple worked on. And you'll see that it's about yay big, it looks like an iPad of today, but they were working on a phone. And it looks nothing like it. It's an ugly breadboard. And you would say, how could that give birth to an iPhone? And the answer is, it does, because of emergence. So this kind of descendant gain of knowledge and learning cycles in order to get to a really powerful idea. So if you believe that, the first step in that is your ability to mentally leap. If you just stand pat where you are and you just explore adjacencies, uh, I don't think it can, in a short time frame, lead you to breakthroughs. Hence, my belief that we have to get people to be comfortable saying silly things, crazy things, argue them and defend them even though they're not real, long enough that they start giving birth to things worth innovating around. That's, that's what I've learned. It's taken me 35 years to learn it, but that's what I've learned. Now you don't have to learn it for your own. <laughs> Practice it five minutes a day. Ask yourself, when's the last time you said something unreasonable? And were you able to laugh it off instead of feel ashamed or have your colleagues make you feel like you don't know what you're talking about. If you can learn how to resist that discriminatory reaction to an imaginary statement, uh, that moment you'll get a special superpower, in my view, because you'll be on your path to a fantastic derivative idea. So that's, that's, what I, that's why imagination is so important. That is such a beautiful lesson, and I like your advocacy for equal rights for imagination. <laughs> Um, you, you talk about how imagination is sort of really the, the root of innovation. And I've also heard you talk about how um, innovation, the way that we approach innovation right now, which is really relevant for this conference, is backwards from the way it should be. How, how should we approach innovation? So um, it's not all innovation. So I guess I'm trying to advocate for a form of innovation that I'm describing a little bit. But let me be more explicit. So the way I view kind of innovation is that if you draw a circle around all current knowledge and all current products in a space, so you can draw a circle around anything, so they're like going to contain it all in a circle. And the question is, where do people innovate relative to that circle? 
Well, a lot of people innovate inside the circle. Those are called niche innovations. And they're filling particular subsets of needs that they identified because the circle is never really full. So they say, ah, if I just do this on Tuesdays and blue, maybe I can get some people. So that's kind of one kind of innovation. The other kind of innovation is what I'll call adjacency-oriented innovation. That is, you uh, explore the adjacent knowledge, the adjacent products, and a subset of them might have value. And that's, what I, that's where 99% of the money goes in. Uh, whether it's academic innovation through grant making or venture capital supported innovation or large company innovation, it's largely an act of exploring adjacencies. If you have enough resource, you can diversify your bets all around the adjacency, and you don't have to bet on which one point is going to succeed. You hedge your bet. Now, now let's put in the element of time. You know that today's circle is going to look like another circle 10, 20 years from now. And at that point, adjacencies will be far away from today's, right? So the question is, why not work on a far out idea that's not in any zone of adjacency, and then, if you can imagine that, work backwards and say, okay, if I want to be able to do this, how do I come back to the present and find support for it? Now, I know all of you sitting here saying it's hard enough to raise money on really adjacent ideas. How am I going to raise money for these totally far out? And, and that's a good point. Uh, but, it, you know, but if you could, if you could, and, and, and I'll tell you, I mean, we, this, our whole institution, Flagship Pioneering, exists to be able to do this. Because we realized that if we went around 20 years ago and told people, give us money on these ideas. And they said, what, are you crazy? And we said, yes, thank you very much. Uh, but we're using I, our imagination. Yeah, we're using, but, but what we did is we decided we needed to have the capital, we needed to have the people, more importantly, the culture, and we need to have the mindsets and the ability to invent. And if you can pull all that together, you can do this institutionally. So I would simply say the following as a broader challenge for you to think about. In any form, in, in when you're fighting social injustice, when you're developing a whole new product line or a whole new belief system, whatever, education, I would argue you have a choice to, of two alternatives, and innovation is no different. You either work in the present, and whatever future results is the future that results based on what you do today, or you first envision the future you want, you think really carefully which is the best future you want to shoot for, and then everything you do today is in support of that future. That's what I call future backwards. I think that that latter gets extremely rarely used because people kind of feel like, again, like I said before, people are going to make fun of you. So that's what I mean. Innovation, the way it's done present forward, I think has certain limitations. By the way, it's also crowded, right? Because in that zone of adjacency, everybody is there looking for value. So you have to ask yourself, what's my advantage? my competitive advantage. If you're honest, you don't have much, right? <laughs> other people have money, other people can work hard, other people are smarter than you, however smart you think you are, other people are smarter than you. So what do you do? I resorted to my life experience, which I'm sure many looking in the room have the same, which is I'm an immigrant. And guess what? As an immigrant, you don't take any of those advantages for granted because you're not an incumbent. You're largely an, an entrant, a new entrant in the space. So as an immigrant, you learn to just basically fight like hell, survive, adapt, and overcome the odds. If you do that with innovation, that is literally intellectually immigrate to a far off place, not your neighborhood, then you have this advantage in that one, the natives will never do that because they just figure, hey, I, got, I, got, I can make money here. Incumbents love adjacencies. So your only core advantage is your willingness to leap. And that, this may not make sense, but if you just put it all together, I think you'll realize that if you're willing to leap, then you're going to be on your own. People make fun of you. But eventually, if there's value and you find it around where you land, then you're, you're going to be able to be the next incumbent. And then your challenge is, how do you don't let the incumbency get to your head? How do you keep staying an immigrant and leaping again and leaping again? That's kind of how we think about it. I love the idea of an immigrant mindset and connected to entrepreneur, uh, being an entrepreneur, because there really there are a lot of parallels there. Um, you also talked about in the beginning, and these are such, you know, you're just sharing so many great wisdom um, pointers that we can take with us, is that you had talked about the word ethical innovation in your first um, answer, and how does, how does that connect? So the people here in this room and the people watching are, are setting out to, to find ways to help the world. 
a lot of your products are, are doing exactly that. And so I think that when you, there's a lot of people who are saying, you know, we're doing good work by, by design of what we're doing. How do you incorporate ethical innovation beyond just doing a, yeah. a project that helps? Well, there's two ways to think about it. One is if your goal is having the impact on society and you can't work in the biotechnology field and not have as your goal impacting society because you're developing cures, you're developing prevention. So that kind of comes with the territory. The question is, can you do it in addition in a fair way? Can you do it? So if you look, for example, and we're going to run out of time here, but you know, if you look at the vaccine development, very early on, Moderna basically slowed down our clinical trials before we even knew our vaccine worked in order to make sure that we had much more diversity in the people who enter our trials. Never been done in the pharmaceutical industry. The diversity we achieved in our first trial with 30,000 subjects, volunteers, was significantly different than what people were showing up to get vaccinated in the trial centers. So your choice is you delayed launching the vaccine. All of you followed how Pfizer was competing with time, et cetera. We slowed down by two months. They beat us by two weeks. We didn't have to slow down by two months, but that would have been an ethical burden we carried because we would not have had a diversified group. Then we pledged in October 2020 to give away our patents and not enforce them in the pandemic to anybody working on a vaccine. A month ago, we, we declared that we will forever pledge our vaccines never to be uh, uh, applied in the COVID case in low and middle income countries. Um, no, it's, I mean, look, we're not, frankly, we're not doing this to be, to, to do, we're doing this because it's the right thing to do. Every company, I'll say this one last thing, every company has an implicit license to operate. And that's the most precious thing it has. And if it loses that, then it cannot have the kind of impact it's worked years and years to have. That's the best way to cause corporations to act ethically. Not all the regulations, all the complaints later. At the end of the day, if people want to have impact, they're going to want to preserve their right to have impact. And that comes from considering all these things in. So we're doing that. We're going to do even more. We just announced a month ago we're, we're building a plant in Kenya for sub-Saharan Africa. $500 million we're going to spend building it. And we'll keep doing it. Honestly, we're doing it because we think that's our corporate responsibility. And by the way, there's 3,000 people working in the company, not 300,000 like big companies. And those 3,000 people insist that we do these things. So we're really happy to be able to have these kinds of discussions in a company that's not yet too incumbent to worry about these things. Um, so I, I, I'm ignoring the time um, because this is just such a fantastic conversation. And, um, I, but the last question should be, what advice do you have to the people here who are setting off to tackle some of these really large problems? You talked about imagination. You talked about keeping that um, immigrant mindset approach to, um, to entrepreneur, to not being an incumbent. Um, what, what other advice do you give to this room? Why? How long do we have? No, okay. Well, as much time uh, as No. So, look, I, I know I'm saying things that are kind of provocative and maybe may seem even aloof or unrelated because you're struggling with day-to-day -day issues, and I don't think these are mutually exclusive. I, I think in addition to everything else, mindset-wise, the thing you have to realize is, one, you have to have a core belief that what you're trying to bring to life has so much impact that, that all the effort and all the overcoming of these is worth it. So first of all, understand one, one image. Most of the value left to be harvested in the future happens to be very close to really dangerous spots. Think of this as the, as the proximity of peril with rewards. You know, people didn't leave much value left away from peril. So when you find yourself in a survival mode, don't assume, boy, that must be very far away from where I'm going to succeed. Because in the startup world, you're constantly at the edge of utter failure or sometimes remarkable success. So one, you have to make peace with that, this surviving, thriving duality. And then the other thing is, at the end of the day, you have two things you need to have in order to be persistent, in my view. One is courage, and the other one is conviction. If you cannot state with conviction what it is that you imagine can be done and why you're doing it, then you're not going to have the courage. No amount of experts giving you advice on this and that. By the way, experts don't suggest you do big, bold things. The experts tell you to do things that they think are reasonable. So courage, conviction, where do you get that? Not just by yourself. You get that from your team. You get that from people you surround yourself with. And, and if you find that that's going, then it's going to be very hard to counteract the So you've got to find, where, where am I going to get this stuff? And I'll say the last thing, which is going to sound even more bizarre being at MIT, where I've spent the last 35, 40 years now, more or less, 
as the following. You know, there's, there's this notion of, I was looking up recently, the word faith. I call all of these things, what we all do, as leaps of faith, right? Leap of faith is not a very MIT terminology, right? I mean, it's like you're supposed to be a rigorous measurement. But a leap of faith. So what does faith mean? Have you ever thought, have you ever asked yourself? I'm not talking about religious faith. I'm talking about just the word faith, right? Faith is belief without facts. Belief without facts. If you cannot have belief without facts about something that you're going to realize in the future, then you're not going to convince anybody to give you the resources to get the supporting facts to support your belief. And then it's never going to be fact. So and when you find yourself saying things that cause people to feel like you're asking them to make a leap of faith, you should not hide that. You should tell them, yeah, you're going to make a leap of faith. We're going to end up in a place where I think there's value. It's going to be really close to danger. So that's the, that's the risk we're taking. And we're going to try to get all the most efficient way of getting facts. And if it turns out to be true, then we have created results. And that's, that's what Moderna did because it was a total leap of faith that you could inject mRNA in the body and have your unsuspecting cells make a, an antigen of spike. I mean, just total leap of faith. But the leap of faith preceded faith. And then I'll say one last thing, and then I'll shut up. They'll kick me out. You know, this is a place where, when I remember when I was a graduate student here, we used to have these like Star Trek marathons. And you know, if you really want to be a geek, be in a corridor watching with a bunch of other MIT students 40 years ago, and my, uh, Star Trek movies, that's what I used to do. And, and there is a, there's a genre of, 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 of literature, I'm going to call it, called science fiction. And, and outside of this and some other few places, that's a very unserious activity, science fiction. I, I don't know if there's any Nobel Prizes for science fiction. And if you ask yourself, why is that? It's because people kind of think fiction is somehow a, a derogatory topic. Well, if think about what, what all this innovation is about. I would argue it's about creating science fiction and then working to take the fiction out of science fiction. If you take the fiction out of science fiction, you have science. And before you say, oh, no, no, surely that science is a different thing, it's not. Because when you go back and look at most of the major scientific breakthroughs that are reported today, there is a much, much earlier suggestion of that, except people were afraid to say it because they thought it's going to be viewed as science fiction. So for, for, for you, if you can just make peace with the fact that for a period of time, a bad idea is going to be science fiction and a good idea is going to be science fiction. And it's just a question of what the experiments show. I think that'll give you the ability to have a much bigger impact. So those are my suggestions. Those are fantastic suggestions, all of them. So to, to summarize, so take the fiction out of science fiction, take leaps of faith, um, have courage and conviction of your ideas, rethink the innovation model, do the right thing for your company, and nurture your imagination to see what can be possible. So with that, we say thank you so much. We're going to welcome back to the stage Alex and Moyle. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much.